Grace, mercy, and peace be with you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We hear our gospel reading for today again, where it says, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, plus some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. And afterward, their other virgins, virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I don't know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. In the name of Jesus. Amen. When Jesus gives a parable, we can hear it in two ways. In the way of the law and the way of the gospel. The law way is easy, since it's the first way we'll hear it. Because as Paul says, the law is written in our hearts. That's the way we naturally think. If you wrong me, the first thought of my sinful flesh isn't, what can I do to bring this person the gifts of Jesus and his forgiveness? But the first thought of my sinful flesh is payback, justice. The one who wronged me needs to pay. The voice of the law makes sense. Everybody knows it. So with the parable, the first way we will hear it is in the way of the law. When Jesus gives the parable of the five virgins with enough oil for their lamps to wait for the bridegroom and five who failed to bring enough oil, the first way we hear it is the law. The five with enough oil, they've done a good thing, good work. They deserve credit. The five who didn't bring oil, they did bad. They deserve the justice that they get. All this makes sense according to the law. So the sermon could simply be, if we were just preaching the law, have enough oil, have enough faith, we will be rewarded. Don't have enough oil, don't have enough faith, bad news for you. With a sermon like that, everyone goes away, but under the condemnation of the law. Jesus doesn't give parables just for the law. To be clear, he certainly preaches the law better than anyone. It's his law, remember? But his preaching of the law is not why he came. In his preaching, it's not his final word or goal. In other words, he doesn't give parables just to show us how to do good works or how you have to have a bunch of faith to get in, as if faith is something you do or you find in yourself. It's not. There were plenty of teachers of the law, too, around there to teach those kinds of things. Remember the scribes, the Pharisees? So Jesus didn't come to die just to get the same thing they were doing. But he did come for the gospel, so that if we hear a parable if we don't hear a parable for the gospel, then we're kind of missing the point as to why he is teaching. So with the parable of the ten virgins, we might ask, rightly, where's the gospel? If we're looking at the virgins and their works, it's not there. Five virgins who do good, five who do bad. The parable is reduced, if that's all we see, to teaching us to do good and be rewarded, or do bad and you'll be, you'll be punished. 
But there's no Jesus in that. There's no cru crucified Christ for you. There's no grace there. There's no mercy there. But what if we don't look to the virgins and we look somewhere else? We look to the one thing in the parable that really makes no sense to us. The bridegroom. He makes no sense to us. Jesus says, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout or a cry, loud cry. Here's the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Louder than that. The bridegroom is delayed. What does that even mean? He took too long getting ready. He got stuck in traffic, maybe. No, he's delayed not just a few minutes. He's delayed all day long, Jesus said. He doesn't show up until midnight. What kind of groom is this that does this? It doesn't make sense to us until we figure out what Jesus is doing. Who is the bridegroom? Well, it's him. Jesus is the bridegroom. He's the groom who came to take his bride, the church. This is what Paul tells us in Ephesians 5. That he gave his life for her. He makes her holy by the washing of water and with the word. He presents his bride in all her splendor, forgiven, cleansed, and sanctified. Jesus is the groom and we're his bride, the church. And he doesn't show up according to any of our expectations. Far from it. The opposite, right? <clears throat> or he doesn't show up or come according to what makes sense to us, our sinful flesh, our reason. But he shows up when he chooses. And it's at just the right time. <clears throat> so when is the last day when he comes again to judge the living and the dead? Well, we know now he's delayed. Hasn't happened yet. How long? That's what we want to know, right? Jesus says no one knows. The law, however, unlike the gospel, is always predictable. The law is according to what makes sense. A groom shows up as expected, who uh, checks off things, and it's all predictable all according to what we would think or expect, but that's not what we see here in this parable, is it? We see a groom who shows up when he chooses at midnight, regardless of what we think. He doesn't watch the clock. He doesn't click off the days in the calendar and his day timer or whatever he's got. And that groom has us saying, too, that's not right. That doesn't make sense. That seems against the rules and contrary to my expectations. But now we can see the gospel of the parable, parable because this group is Jesus who comes to save his people from their sins. And the longer he waits, the more he gathers in to his church. The more people he baptizes and cleanses and purifies. Because he doesn't just come for one nation or one people or one type of person, right? Rich, poor, slave, free, he comes for all. For God so loved the world that he gave Jesus. And he shows up when he chooses and how he chooses. And this is actually good news. Because this groom comes with not just the condemnation of the law. He comes as the Lamb of God to take away your sin. He comes as the one who bears your sin on the cross and the sin of the whole world. He comes to give gifts, not according to the law, but according to his mercy. Not according to what you do or how much stuff you have in you. Because guess what? If the law were to come to you and to me and when we preach it, we have no good thing in us. It's not what goes into a man that defiles him, Jesus says, is what comes out of him. It's the heart. And so Jesus came not to give what we deserve, but that's what grace means. He comes to give a gift anyway. 
So as we suffer in this life, as we wait for this last day, which no one knows except God, and we undergo temptation as the disciples right after this in Matthew 26, 27 are about to experience, we too ask the question, where's our salvation? When will we be delivered? But this parable has us not looking to ourselves, not looking to see who's in and who's out, although we know that is a reality. Some will reject this gift. But instead, this parable has us looking not to one another, not to ourselves or our works or how much faith we have, but looking to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross. In other words, it was his joy to die for you. He didn't do it begrudgingly. He didn't do it, oh, i got to do this. He did it in love. He did it in joy for you and for me. And so Jesus, the one who died, is our groom. To bring us to the feast that's to come. And every time we have the Lord's Supper, every time we go to receive His body and blood for our forgiveness, and that we might be kept in our faith, because we're always in, in our sinful flesh resisting His gifts, He draws us again to His name, to His body and blood, to strengthen us. And it's a foretaste of the feast to come every time. That great wedding feast, it's called, of the Lamb. And so, although we don't see Him with our eyes, we see Him in faith. Because this is where we see, as Christians now, one day we'll see with ease when He comes again. Everyone will see. Every eye will see. But for now, we see here with these ear holes. Because faith is given to you, or the oil given to you, comes from hearing. And hearing from the words of Jesus, who says, this is my body, this is my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. It's in your baptism where you're sealed as one who is his bride. One who is certainly looking to be with him forever and ever. And so we hear Paul speak about this and speak about those who have died before Jesus comes again, which may be all of us in this room or may not be. We don't know, remember? But he says, they're not dead. They're asleep. And so he says, the Lord himself, Paul says this, will descend from heaven with a shout. Sounds just like the parable, doesn't it? A shout of command with the voice of an archangel and the sound of the trumpet of God. I bet that trumpet is awesome. And the dead, those who are asleep in Christ or through Christ, will rise first. And then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Comfort one another, says Paul. This is what the church is to do, to comfort one another with these words. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses any of our human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.